Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 8, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of, busy, out of your busy schedule. You tried to say to be here. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. And believe me, it often does. So what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, that's actually going to be the focus of our show today. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them, to the sl keep them related to the slides, and we should have plenty of time once we get the live charts for our other questions. And then, of course, if you have some favorite stock picks, let me know what they are. Two suggestions there for your benefit. Number one, wait until we get to the live charts, and I'll let you know what that is. And two, just to make sure I cover as many as possible, put in one ticker and then hit enter or one ticker at a time. That way I'll know which ones I covered and which one, which ones I have it. So I want to get back to market timing simplified. As you know, I go on these deep dives into psychology and then I come back to a little technical analysis and occasionally some money management. But I think given the conditions of the market, it's important come, to come back to market timing simplified. And then obviously we need to think whether or not winter is still coming. Now, you've had a few false alarms from me over the years when it comes to winter is coming or is winter coming. But I think it's important to be prudent when these things occur. That bastard John Snow complained about winter coming forever and winter finally did come. So I guess the question is, are we back into the woods as far as a bear market update? Well, I wouldn't say we're in a bear market, but there are some things that are a little concerning. Now, just to go back to the basics for a minute, and the reason I like to go back to the basics is we all tend to get a little too... I don't know if full of ourselves is the correct phrase, but we all tend to overcomplicate things. And sometimes we fail to see the forest or the trees. But an uptrend, obviously, is a series of higher highs and a series of higher lows. And, of course, a downtrend, same thing. A series of lower lows and lower highs, I know. Now, where it gets a little questionable is when a market makes new highs and begins to pull back, especially if that market pulls back below the last pullback. So that's when you have to question whether or not the uptrend is coming to an end. Now, if we take a look at the S&P 500, we had a pretty impressive run from the December lows. We pulled back. And then we took off again and made higher highs. But once again, we're pulling back. Now, I don't like a market that pulls back below the last breakout. Or another way of putting that would be pulls back into the prior pullback. So let's take a a look at this a little bit closer look so notice that we did make a new high here obviously and then new closing highs here and here and here so it was looking pretty good we began to break out a little bit but unfortunately we came right back in to where we broke out now one of the reoccurring themes that i've been talking about quite a bit is i hate it when a market breaks out but doesn't break out decisively and the reason is one or two big down days the market comes right back in. Well, in this case, this is a weekly chart. So as you can see, just one ugly down week puts you back into what I call the sideways soup. Now, to simplify this even further, where is the close now? Well, it's right here at this 2800, I believe. And let's go back in time all the way to, wait a minute, I'm just noticing this myself. Let's go all the way back to last August, and where were we? Okay, well, around 2800. So that's the sideways soup. That's always not a good thing, or that's 
not a good thing, I should say, for the trend follower. So that's a little bit concerning. But as you can see in a few minutes, it's certainly not the end of the world just yet. But you may want to pay careful attention to what's going on. A while back, I created the 10% TFM system. And I was just noodling around, messing around, didn't feel like doing whatever projects I was working on or anything else. So I started playing around with the charts. And I got to thinking, if you're within 10% of a 50-week closing high, then stay long. And if you're more than 10% away from a 50-week closing high, you might want to get out of the market. In some cases, maybe even short it. Now, the market is the overall market, although I do think I have a slide coming up that talks about using something like this in Bitcoin. And if not, I will pull it up for you. So rules are pretty simple. I'm not going to go into a lot of details on this since we've beat the dead horse over and over. You can watch prior week of charts and get much more detailed presentations. But basically, we're just going to buy when the market is less than 10% away from its 50-week closing high. And the last two lows are greater than the 50-week Moving average, in other words, two weeks of Landry Light. That's the entire buy. That's it. The Landry Light is just a whipsaw filter to help keep you from chasing your own tail. Now, we're going to exit the market when it's 10% or more away from its 50 week closing high. And we're not going to require a Landry Light because two weeks of Landry Light could get pretty ugly pretty quick. They slide faster than they glide. And every time I say that, a pilot, Dave, a glide actually goes down. Well, you know what I mean. They take the escalator up and the elevator down. So let's take a look at this. Notice back in March, if you look at this little ribbon on the bottom, and the way the ribbon works, and I'm going to show you some more details on this in one second, when the market is more than 10% away from its 50-week closing high, it goes neutral. And if it's more than 10% away from its 50-week closing high and below its 50-week moving average, it goes bearish. Now, it'll be neutral sometimes when the market, as you can see, is less than 10% away from its 50 week closing high, but below or intersecting its 50 week moving average. So notice that where it went bullish, you had a buy, and my chart got offset a little bit. So this buy actually is this bar right here because you have one week, two weeks of Landry Light. And if we zoom that in, you could see. That red line is your 50-week moving average. The green line, by the way, is your TFM 10% line. And I'll show you how that works in just one second. So your buy would be the close of that week when the lows for the last two weeks, the present, the current week, and the prior week are above the 50-week moving average. And you're less than 10% away from the 50-week closing high. Now, just real quick, and I don't want to get too far sidetracked, but just so in case you're somebody new is watching or watching the recording, what I'm suggesting here, as I sort of mentioned earlier, is that if a market is near less than 10% away from its this is the 10% line here. If it's less than 10% away from a 50 week closing high, and let's say that A is here and B is here and C is here, technical analysis 101 says if a market can go from A to C, it has to go through B along the way. That's a hard and fast concrete rule when it comes to technical analysis. No other methodologies when it comes to market timing has a hard and fast rule like this. This is inescapable. 
So my whole idea is as long as we're near C, stay long, because if we could go beyond C, not beyond C, beyond C, then we're gonna have to be near C to begin with, okay? So notice that, let's say this was our 50 week closing high back here. So as long as we're within 10% of that, we're okay. Not that anything bad could happen because obviously we will get sell signals. But then, if you stay long, as long as that happens, then let's say C is right here, then you go beyond C, okay? You, C just keeps resetting. And, and in some charts, I actually draw in the 50-week closing high, and it looks, it'll look something like this in a case like this. And then once you get to this point here, it'll go forward until it gets exceeded again and look like that, okay? So obviously we're working off of this 50 week closing high that we hit when? Just right there in July. And that's gonna stay in place until and unless we take it out. So very, very, very simple system. Although it's simple, I've gotten a thousand questions on it and you know, keep them coming, that's great. And I actually have gotten tripped up quite a bit myself. And this is, this is a testament to keeping things simple a simple system is going to be easier to follow than a more complex one. So this was our buy right here. And this line's a little off again. So this line needs to be a, a tad bit higher. But you get the idea. So the buy was on this week here. And then it goes forward. And I'll show you the spreadsheet in just one second. In fact, literally one second. <laughs> so here's a spreadsheet. We've kind of beat the dead horse here. Couple of highlights, real quick, without getting into too many details. I'm not trying to sell you on a system. In fact, it's free. But there's a few things that are interesting here. And my goal was not to try to print money with this, although it'd be nice to print money with it. But a bigger, more important thing is to avoid nasty drawdowns. So 44% in 2000 and 52% in 2008, late 2007, late 2008, from following a system like this. If you're buy and hold, you would have lost over half of your account. But it came back, okay? Well, it doesn't always come back. And that's what I preach. And that's why I say it's a fact, a statistic. People don't like, people don't like to face the facts, but I'll say, hey, you know, Sometimes it might take 25 years or more for a market to come back if people are like, no, that's no way. I don't believe you. It's like, well, go back and look at the 20s or 30s. Look at the 70s, how awful, how awful the market was for so long. And all of that's in the layman guide, layman's guide to trading stocks, which at this particular point in time, it's August 8th, I think there's still a pop-down ribbon where you can still get it free on my website. And then if you go back to 2018, this 11% is nothing to sneeze at. Like I said, let's say you had a million dollars for retirement. Like I say, I should say, or the example I've used before, you've got a million dollars for retirement and you lose $110,000 over a small period, a short period of time, you could be a hurt and pop. And then obviously back here, if you decide you're gonna retire in mid 2009, mid 2009, yeah, mid 2008, I should say, you now have half of your retirement. So your lifestyle, you had $10 million, you have five, eh, you'll be okay probably. But if you had a million dollars, now you have 500K, well, your life has changed drastically, okay? You might still be able to live, but not live quite as well as before. So anyway, the main thing or the main purpose of this is to avoid nasty drawdowns. And inadvertently, a lot of other things have come out of it, like, hey, where are we now, an objective way of measuring the market. Not the only way, but an objective way of letting us know. A couple other things just real quick uh, before I forget. And again, let's not beat the dead horse here too much. But number one is avoiding those diaper change moments, meaning those ugly, ugly drawdowns. The other thing that's kind of interesting is I just looked back about 31 years. So you'd be long 31 years with buy and hold. But with this simple little system, you would 
actually only be long about 24 and a half years. Now that doesn't sound like a big difference, but you're actually out of the market for over six years. So 20% of the time you're out of the market. And that's a good thing sometimes. Obviously if the market's not trending, spending the years out of the market and you know, what's the old saying? As I often say, better be on the dock drinking beer, which you were out to sea than out to sea, wishing you were on the dock drinking beer. And I've had quite a few of those situations, more of the <laughs> out to sea wishing I was on the dock, because those tend to be more a lot more memorable. And I notice one of you guys who's who does a little market timing with his uh, longer term investments was recently recently actually the market and was talking about just that. So the ribbon, getting back to the ribbon down here, really, really, really simple stuff. As long as you have two bars above or more the 50 week moving average, and as long as you're above the TFM 10% line, which is just 0.9 of the closing high. So if you were to take Let's look at this blatant closing high here. If you were to take this closing high here, subtract 10% from it, we'll give you this line here. Notice this line doesn't change until when? Well, you start making new closing highs. Or let me rephrase that. Your look back period, this is what, see, it gets confusing fast, right? So once you get 50 days into the future, which is right here, then this becomes, well, let's see. Yeah, this right here would be your 50 week closing high. So it does adjust eventually. Now, if you get into a long, prolonged bear market where the market just kind of works its way lower, eventually this little line, as you'll see, I think in these slides, if not, go in and watch some YouTube archives, will eventually catch up to price. But if price, spikes down, let's say we had a big spike down, then this line would stay way up here. So it is and can be slow to catch up with price. So we're bullish as long as the lows, at least two lows are greater than the moving average and we're above the TFM line. We go neutral when we either close below the TFM line or intersect the 50 week moving average. So right here we went neutral, we went back to bullish. We went back to neutral here, why? Well, because we closed below the 50 week moving average. And in this particular day here, we had intersected it, okay? And it's gonna stay neutral until unless you get two lows above that 50 week moving average and you're also above the green line. Well, as a general statement, if you have two lows above the 50 week moving average, not let me rewind that, actually you won't. I was thinking that if you had two lows above the 50 week moving average, you would also be within 10%, but that's only in an uptrend. Let's take a look at what happened. Notice that again, you were bullish for a long, long time, so just relax. You began to intersect the 50 week moving average. So that's a warning sign. You go back to trading above, the lows above, Landry light, in other words, lows above the 50 week moving average. So you relax again. I know, relax, haha. Uh -huh. We had a warning back in October because we did what? We intersected the 50 week moving average. And then we had a sell because we went more than 10% away from the 50 week closing high. Notice that we closed below the green line. That's 10% below the 50 week closing high. And then immediately it went to neutral. So wait a minute, we might've just had a whipsaw here. So let's go ahead and get ready. Nope, it's bearish once again. And then what happened? The market had that V-shaped recovery. We get within 10% of its closing high, but notice that we haven't gotten past that 50 week moving average. And then in March, we had the buy. And then immediately the market had a little bit of a pullback. 
So we're like, uh-oh, that might have been a whipsaw. Go back to relax. We had a warning back in May, June, or specifically June. And then we're back. Believe it or not, we're back and we're still in relax mode because we are not more than 10% away from the 50-week closing high. And we're still above the 50-week moving average. Now, notice that this line is beginning to catch up with price because we're going off of this close here. That's our new 50-week closing high. So we could get a sell signal fairly soon, but so far, it's hanging in there. And this is what it looks like longer term. And it stayed bullish and neutral. I'm sorry, bearish and neutral for a long time during the bear market of 2000 to 2003. It stayed bullish and neutral during the uptrend that followed. And notice back here, like I was saying earlier, that this green line, the TFM 10% line, did catch up with price because we had a two year bottom, the market bottom for two years. Notice over here, it took a little bit longer to catch up with price. Why? Because we had more of a spike bottom in 2009. Now, this is just one system. It's not a be all end all. So you would also want to look at other things. And we had a lot of other systems, especially on a daily chart that were triggering back in 2009 during that V-shaped bottom. And we started buying a lot of stocks back then. But anyway, during the bear market, obviously bearish and neutral. And then you'll see that there are some whipsaws along the way. And I think there's been two or three in this last huge bull run. But that's okay. You're not going to avoid death, taxes, and whipsaw. And I thought I could do a presentation without saying it, but it's going to be impossible. As Greg Moore says, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. Losing half of your retirement, that's pretty devastating within a year's time. You could survive frustration. And so forth, still long. So again, death, taxes, and whipsaws could not be avoided. The most recent sell-offs in 2016 and 2018, I think that as a trader, if you didn't get out the way, if you didn't allow your positions to get stopped out, and you didn't exit the market, then I think you are delusional. Now, I'll be happy to argue that with you. But trust me, if a market is going to sell off 50%, it will sell off 10% first. And let's knock on wood here. There's no guarantees in life or in trading. But so far, every bear market in history, if you followed this little simple system, it would have gotten you out of every major bear market in history, including 1987. No guarantees, though, obviously. So a couple of random thoughts. I've kind of beat the dead horse on this before, so let me just rush through it. It's just another tool. It's a puzzle piece, if you will. And if you do get a sell signal, it could obviously be the start of something bigger. If it goes neutral after a buy, you might want to pay attention, okay? It could go neutral here really soon. If you're under a buy, so to speak, then focus on the long side. If you're under sell, then you want to be selective on the long side. And for the more advanced, possibly consider shorting. Now, as I often preach, shorting, I believe in shorting, but shorts are a pain in the ass. And you're not going to get rich on the short side. Well, D, why do you want to short? Well, one, it's the only way to make money to bear market. That's the captain obvious reason. But the other reason is that it helps to, for you to see both sides of the market. As I preach ad nauseum, my friends who run hundreds and hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions, hundreds of millions of dollars who are long only oriented, the glass is always half full. Me being a trader, I get a little bit more skeptical when the market is looking iffy. So the designer's intent for this system is for the overall market. And I don't know if I have the slide coming up or not, but I'm gonna show you an experiment I'm doing with Bitcoin. 
using GBTC. It can possibly use in other markets, but I prefer using my core methodology in more inefficient markets, such as stocks in general, and of course, some IPO things in the IPOs. So if you were to use it in other markets, that 10% is based on the S&P. You would have to adjust accordingly. In the Bitcoin, I have it set to 30%. Dave, 30%, that sounds crazy. Well, that's what it takes, okay? So in other markets, it might be lower or higher, depending on the volatility. Maybe if you're using this in bonds, which that might actually work. Somebody wants to do a little research in bonds, knock yourself out. That'd be fantastic. That's a great idea. It might be, it might be 5%. And by the way, even though this is just a little tool, I think there's something bigger here. A couple of you have taken the ball and ran with it, and I'm pretty excited about that. And you're incorporating it into your longer-term trading plans, and that's kind of uh, really exciting for me. I know I'm a nerd. So anyway, individual stocks or other markets, it would be something other than 10%. Now, there's plenty of other simplified stuff that I look at. Just the Landry light in and of itself, meaning that if the lows are greater than 50-week moving average, you generally want to be long. And you could see the roaring 90s, the great 90s, the awesome 90s. The indicator of top, which counts the number of days the market is above. It's 50-week moving average. Stayed green for a long, long time. Had a little tiny bit of red in a correction but not much, and then the market came right back. And then you see bear market. What's pretty amazing to me is the 2000 bear market stayed red the entire time, all the way up until 2003. And then if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can see the bull market between 2003, 2007. It stayed green nearly the entire time. The other thing that's pretty amazing is during the bear market 2008, you could see that it stayed red most of the time. Now, the market did kind of rally off that V-shaped bottom. There was a little lag in the Landry light, but not a tremendous amount. So just something as simple as Landry light above or below the 50-week moving average can do a pretty damn good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. And again, 2010, 2011, mostly green. We had that little correction back in 2011. That looked a little ugly at the time. I think I got out of the way. I might even put on some shorts. Have put on some shorts. Probably did. Knowing me, we stayed green for three or four years. We had a little spill in 2015, 2016. Things looked pretty ugly back then. We got out of the way. And then we've green for a long, long time. Then obviously, Last little spill we had going back to late 2018, early 2019, and now we're, so far, we're green again. So we need to pay attention, make sure we stay green. Somebody asked me a while back, can you stop showing weekly bow ties? Well, just notice that if you're following the weekly bow ties, meaning a crossing of the 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential, over a fairly short period of time, that can do a really good job, like these other systems, of keeping you on the right side of the market. We did have a weekly rollover back at the end of 2018, meaning that the moving average just crossed over, but there wasn't a trigger. And major signals come off of all-time highs and I hate to say all-time lows, all-time lows for other markets. Now. Patterns are fractal. I get asked this a lot. Can I use bow ties on a five-minute chart? Yeah, knock yourself out. In a more efficient market like the S&P 500, I like to pay attention to what's going on on an hourly basis. Notice recently we had all-time highs, and the 10 simple was greater than 20 exponential, and the 20 exponential was greater than the 30 exponential, and then those flip-flopped over. Market pulled back a little bit. Now, it wasn't a clean, clean, tight setup, but if you're just measuring the moving average crossings, you did a, you did technically have a crossing after all-time highs. 
And then you see that triggered and the market obviously has spilled pretty seriously since. And now it's bouncing back a little bit. All right. Any questions on any of this? And we'll get to the live charts now. And I'll go ahead and flesh these concepts out a little bit further and see where we are in the sectors and everything else. All right, let's go to the P's first. And again, you can see that today we have a decent update so far of about a percent of the third. You know, maybe just maybe the market just big old nasty fake out. And maybe we dodged a bullet. But I'm not going to get too excited until unless we go on to make brand new highs. And as I said earlier, your net net price change can often be your best friend. Let's go back in time and see. Let's go see how far we can go back in time. Let's go all the way back to. Oops. Let's go all the way back to last August. End of last August. So if you'd have bought at the end of last August and held on to now, you'd be up one quarter of a percent. You'd have been down. 1% earlier today. So on a net net basis, you can see we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress. You know the routine though, take things one day at a time. If you kind of look at this big picture pullback like we talked about earlier, we had the thrust, oops, we had the thrust, we had the pullback, we had the thrust, and now we have the pullback. We pulled back below the prior pullback, which is concerning, if we take out this low here, then it would be really concerning, and I'm sure all those systems would begin to trigger. Now, let's take a look just for S and Gs, and I think I have it programmed in here. Nope. There it is. What's interesting is your 50-day moving average, believe it or not, is still headed higher. That just shows you how you have lag in moving averages, especially exponential, especially simple ones. Let me just rewind that. This shows you how much lag there is in moving average, especially in simple moving averages. So moving average hasn't caught up with price because you only had about, oh, two weeks of a spill in here, and that's not enough to trigger that moving average to turn down. But you can see we are below the 50-week, 50 50-day 50 moving average. Getting a little tripped up. And we're not too far away from 2,800, which would be the... 200-day moving average. Now, nothing magical about a moving average, but if we draw a horizontal line, we see that the moving average is right about, or just above, I should say, the prior lows in here. As I often say, it's like the thermos. The thermos keeps the hot things hot, cold things cold. The old Cajun joke, how do it know? Well, technical analysis, same thing. A lot of technicals come together at the same point, so how do it know? It's kind of interesting to me. I'm a nerd, though. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ Composite, still well below its 50-week, I'm sorry, 50-day moving average. I talked about weekly charts too much. We did have that golden cross back here. Don't get too excited about that. With any signal, it's not the signal in and of itself, but the magnitude of what happens next. So like we saw earlier with the TFM 10% system, if you get a sell signal and the market loses half of its value, that's important. That's relevant. But you can see we're right at the 50-day moving average. Nothing magical about that. 50-day moving average still headed higher so far in the NASDAQ like the S&P 500. Some of the other things I'm concerned about the NASDAQ, just like all the other indices, or any other market, I should say, is that we didn't really break out decisively past the prior peaks. And the problem with that is one or two big down days, as you can see, just one, two, bam, bam, and you're back into the sideways soup. But hey, let's hope we just bounce right back and go back to new highs. That would be fine with me. I know you said hope.
Russell 2000, eh, decent day today, but let's not start kissing each other just yet. I think you really have to see the forest for the trees here, sharp thrust lower, big retrace rally. Until the less we take out, let's say, 162, I wouldn't get too excited about the Russell. Now, let's take a look at bonds real quick before I forget. Bonds yesterday provided us with a pretty decent opening gap reversal. If you're in the Facebook group, you saw that I was talking about the TMV. And you could see that we had a really nice gap lower. This is a burning dog trade. I stole that line from Linda Rasky from her excellent book, Trading Sardines. But Dave, you're a trend trader. Why would you go against the trend? Well, sometimes a market gets so extremely oversold, it just has a feeling of exhaustion. And when you see these big gaps lower, sometimes they could be worth playing. I thought the same thing yesterday in dust, and it really didn't, it really didn't materialize that much. And it ended up being a little bit better than a poke in the eye type of trade. But bonds, by the way, let's take a get back to the TLT. Bonds are just kind of shot higher in here. And now they're beginning to correct from those a little bit. They got a little bit ahead of themselves. So going the other way, and this is a way I would prefer to trade with the trend. If we did get a, let me just move this out a little bit. If we did get a big gap lower in the bonds, especially after just begging out all time highs, today's gap was not big enough to trade. But if we get a big gap lower, followed by some strength, it might be worth going after as an opening gap reversal. One reason I've been talking a lot about opening gap reversals lately, especially in the Q&A, in fact, last two or three sessions, and then I'll have uh, to the service members and to the members, the gold members of DaveLearning.com, I'll have that posted over the weekend or hopefully maybe much sooner. I talk, I've been talking a lot about opening gap reversals. Now, I don't want to rush out and try to trade them every day, but when the opportunity presents themselves, I'm going to be there to take it. And I just got to be careful. And one thing I was actually doing a little writing this morning is you got to be careful not to trade for activity because trading for activity is really synonymous with, with gambling. But if you wait and pick your spots carefully, when you see a market like this, just blast to all time highs. I think that's all time highs. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, close enough. Blast all time highs and begin to weaken a little bit intraday. You know that you possibly have a potential trade in the works. Energies, getting, let's get to the sectors here. You can see banging out new lows, multi month lows. You certainly don't want to be long any energies. Metals and mining, believe it or not, even though gold and silver are doing okay, have looked abysmal as of late, although decent little bounce today. Gold yesterday busted out, brand new highs, came right back in, coming back a little bit today. Ditto for silver. We really haven't had a whole lot of good entries to get long gold and silver as of late, so we just have to wait. What's interesting is the foods actually begin to roll over with the overall market, and tobacco actually slid too, and consumer non-durables. None of these areas are too excited to trade, but the reason I'm pointing them out is that the these areas, these so-called defensive areas, did not recover or did not, there was no flight to safety in those areas. Banks, as you can see, big slide there, looking kind of ugly today, notwithstanding. Anything financial related, let's take a look at financials overall. That's insurance. Let's take a look at financials, you can see, kind of imploded as of late. So... We're definitely in wait and see mode in this overall market. And people say, why do you take things one day at a time? It's because, especially if a market just barely break it out, because one bad day would change everything. Hardware has imploded as of late. I guess that's really just Apple, but let's take a look at Apple. You can see Apple imploded as of late after making multi-week highs or multi-month highs. Software looking pretty ugly in here, a little bit of a gap. Closing the gap today, but I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. Civic deductors looking darn ugly in here. This is kind of a poster child for not really clearing the prior highs decisively and what could possibly happen. Not that you want to short breakouts, but you want to pay attention when you have a breakout and it's somewhat anemic. 
and the market comes back in like it did. So that's pretty much the sector action. As you can see, fairly concerning overall, fairly ugly overall. Russell still looks really, really bad. S&P 500 and NASDAQ, a little dubious here until, until and unless, or if, I should say, they get past their prior highs, then I'd start feeling a little bit better. All right, let's open it up for individual questions. While we do that, if you are a member of DaveLander.com, then you should join the Facebook group. My ultimate goal with this learning management system is to create a mastermind group. And I didn't intend the Facebook group, or I, I didn't think the Facebook group would be would turn out that way, but it did. And so far it's been pretty cool. So I'm pretty excited about it. So make sure you do join the Facebook group. We've had some really good interactions there lately. I've picked up a few ideas from you guys and I know I've thrown out a few things lately. So I know you guys have picked up a few things from me too. And let me just show you real quick. If you are a gold member, now as soon as I say this, or as soon as people watch, I'm gonna get 50 requests. <laughs> you have to be a gold member. It's a free group, but you have to be a gold member, and that's just to keep the riff raff out. But right here, just click right there to join the Facebook group. And I have to personally approve you. So put your email in, make sure you use the email that you use to join DaveLander.com members, and I'll see you in the group. And that's where a lot of times. I can answer a lot of questions on the fly and everybody can benefit. And that's part of my bigger picture model here too, is going from a one-on-one -on -one relationship that I've had for years and years with many of you to a one to many. And that's to help everyone. In many cases, people I've worked with directly thinking that they, they know everything they need to know about money management, psychology, et cetera. I see them make mistakes and I'm like, why are you making these mistakes? Now that I have a learning management system, I can go in and see what they are doing and whether or not they have completed the courses and where they are with all that. All right, let's, any uh, individual, you guys want to talk about individual issues, feel free to start asking about them now. And I'll get my chart set up here. Got a quiet bunch today. There's not a whole lot going on. There's a couple things I'll show you while we're waiting on that. There hasn't been a tremendous amount of trading lately, or I haven't had a tremendous amount of trading lately, but I have pulled off a couple of opening gap reversals that have worked nicely, so that's kind of cool. And I just talked about those. So real quick, let me just show you something the learning management system. What I was saying earlier is when you come into these courses, we can see your progress because it's tracked and you can see how much of each course you have finished. So if I come in and people are asking me a bunch of questions about TKOs and persistent pullbacks and things like that, it's like, well, wait a minute, you haven't even begun or barely began methodology. Why don't you get through methodology first? And then that's going to fill in a lot of those holes. And then if you still have questions, we'll, Go to the Q&A, and we'll cover them in the Q&A. Anyway, the bottom line is, and I know I'm nerdy, but I'm pretty excited about all this, but it's, it, and it's been great so far. I'm helping those who truly want to be helped. All right, let me show you one or two things, and then we'll wrap it up if we don't have any questions. So like I said, there hasn't been a whole lot of trading. The only position trade that I put on recently would be GSX. And that was an IPO type of setup. And I think it was a buy at B, but it also, if I can get the moving average to plot, there it is. Notice that you had a close above, let me draw it in better. So with this particular setup which you could actually get off my website and I flesh it out a lot more under the methodology in the members area 
But with this particular setup, we're looking for A, a new closing high. And if the close, I'm sorry, if the day one for the first five days of trading set the brand new high, so this particular stock set the high on day one, and then immediately begin to implode, but the high was set, okay? It not only has to close at a new closing high, which would have actually been here, because this is your highest close, right? It has to also close above that day one high. Now, these are, these are my favorite patterns when you have that day one high like this, where it forms, I'd much rather this maybe trade down here somewhere, maybe day two or three or four or five set that high. But it is what it is, and when this happens, it has to close at an all-time high, not just a closing high, and you must have Landry Light above the five-day SMA. So it's five-day SMA, okay? Donald, you read my mind. That was a stock that I was debating on whether or not to talk about, but since most people here are on the trading service, I'll go ahead and pull that one up. This is a weed stock, and the buy at B, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, and also probably, let's put in the, I don't think the moving average is going to work just yet, because it takes an extra day, let's see. It doesn't work, you, it'll work in um, stockcharts.com, but it doesn't, it won't come up in this. But yes, this would actually be a buy setup. Now again, I kind of hate it when they make the, the day one high. So that's day one, this is day two, this is day three, this is day four. What's the earliest we'll possibly buy an IPO? On the close of day five, but this was not a new closing high, okay? And since day one set the high for the week, okay? So let's say you had day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. That's the new high. We're not worried about this high here. We're just looking for the highs close. Let's say close there on that day. Then that would be the reference point for an issue, for an, a setup, I should say. That would be the reference point for a setup for a either buy at B or the Landry Light five day SMA. I, I need to come up with a better name for that. But your five day moving average is probably somewhere in here and you're probably above it. Either way, though, we will get to have a buy on the close. So any close above this level, but I would also make sure you give it a little bit of wiggle room. And I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but accidentally I saw an article where there's an ample supply of weed. So I am wondering if a weed grower is still a hot stock to be in, but I don't want to confuse the issue with facts too much. Just go back to my regular technical analysis and say, do I have a buy or not? I have a buy. So it might be worth going after a, a, on a close above this high. So let's see what happens on that. All right, any more? A quiet bunch today. There's just not a whole lot of setups out there, so that's not surprising. In fact, I've I've got a few stocks on my Landry list for today, but I'm not going after any of them. And I've been telling my people for a couple of weeks now, maybe even three weeks, let's not take any action. Just don't see anything to go after that's worthwhile. And I don't like the way the market's acting, especially in more recent times when it came right back in. About two weeks ago, I actually started getting kind of excited about the market, but I still didn't have any setups. And sometimes that's a database talking, telling you maybe you should sit on your hands, ACST. Um, this is one that I saw, if you zoom in, zoom in on it, it looks a lot better than if you zoom way out. My one concern here is the HV is pretty crazy at 106 okay it's also tripled over a short period of time so i think it's a little too crazy to go after 
even by Big Dave standards. But if you did, I'd actually like to see even more pullback. I know it's crazy because it's hit 280. It's just too crazy. I hear you and I see what you're seeing. In longer term, it's kind of all over the place. But yeah, shorter term, it looks pretty impressive, but it's just a little too wild and crazy, even by my standards. All right, any more? All right, while we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. Anything unanswered, send me an email or ideally uh, send it to the contact form at www.davelander.com slash contact. Anything requiring a lot of thoughts, I'll put together a presentation to cover it in the next Q&A, and I'll make sure you get access to that if you're not already a member. I might. Man, who knows? All right. Everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, and thank you once again. Thanks all you guys and girls for coming. Appreciate it very much.